Chapter four, marketing research. As with strategy and with international, marketing research has its own field, has its own domain, and has its own subject. So this is really the highlights package. Specifically, one of the things I want to address in this highlights package is that marketing research for us for this semester doesn't involve any statistics, doesn't involve any numbers, so you can relax on that front. However, the thing about marketing research is that even when it does involve numbers and statistics and equations, the point of the exercise is to come up with information that can be used to support consumer behavior, can be used to support understanding the markets or business decision making. So what we're looking at here is that we're looking at the first transition point of the content. For the last few chapters, last three chapters, we have been talking about marketing from the business perspective. What we're about to start doing is talk about marketing from the perspective of understanding the consumer. Now we're not yet at the point where we're going to actually make decisions based on the consumer. Here we're looking at the background information. What do we need to know? What do we need to understand in order to collect the right type of information and to be able to get the knowledge and insight into the consumer. So we're going to start with market research and we're going to talk about the different techniques, the different methods and the different approaches you can take to getting your hands on the relevant data and then how that data converts into useful information that you can use for making a decision. So we talk about marketing and the concepts of the marketing information system. This is basically a nice big overarching view of the world that says, when we're dealing with the customer, we either get money or data, sometimes both. If you think about Facebook for a moment. Facebook gets information. Facebook gets data from us. Our actions, behaviors, likes, social networks, interactions, all these things are points of data. So for them, the customer donates information. From a marketer's perspective, that information can then be used for targeting, segmentation, advertising, branding, there's a whole lot of things that can happen. But the most important thing from our perspective for this subject is that when you're looking at an interaction with a customer, the question is, how much money are we getting from it and how much intel are we going to get from it? So the information system is not a single off-the-shelf purchase object. It's not like we have a laptop computer and then that's it, you've got your information system. There are four pieces of background content that you have in your information system. You've got the internal company data, which is basically your research, your records. You've got your marketing intelligence, which is your environment scans and the things we've been talking about. You've got your marketing research, which is where we are looking at customized answers to specific problems. And you've got your acquired databases, where you basically have access to existing material. Now I'm going to tell you now, one of the things that I'm trying to build up for you this semester is your own personal marketing intelligence and acquired database particularly the marketing intelligence. Any piece of information, any marketing intel you can gather, we're talking here the conference papers, the journal articles, the book chapters, all the materials that you need to acquire for your assignments are things that you can store, save and bring with you. So you build up your own database, your own personal library of marketing intelligence. This is one of the reasons why I'm asking you to do a lot of secondary data collection this semester. Now, when we're making it fancy and complicated, the marketing information system goes through computer hardware, computer software. Realistically, it can be as simple as a notepad file or an Excel file, or it can be a complicated, customized uh, piece of software. For you this semester, one of the things I'd recommend is an Excel file. When you collect a PDF file of a journal article or a conference paper, put the author and year in the first cell, put the full reference and citation in the second cell and put your notes about it in the third cell. And there you have it. You've got yourself a marketing information system. So let's go talk about pieces of information that are useful and important to us as marketers. 
One of the things that we start off with is the internal company data. Internal company data basically is what we already know. So this is the known knowns and the known unknowns. From within the company, we have some absolutely invaluable pieces of information. The very first thing I want you to really appreciate about marketing research is a lot of it is internal. So we've got marketing campaign results. We've got customer complaints. Some of the richest sources of new product development or product modification is when the customer is so kind as to tell us what's wrong. We've got the customer history. We've got our knowledge of our interaction, customer loyalty card information. We've got our sales staff who are information collectors. And we've got their feedback. And we also have things like the financial reports, the sales reports. We have a wealth of data in-house. Now, each of these needs to be considered in terms of what is a problem that can be solved in-house with the data we have to hand, and how good is that data in terms of its reliability. The marketing intelligence, this is one of the skills that you are being guided through with your assignments. Now, the reason why, as a marketer, I am going to ask you to do an assignment on marketing research and an assignment on a couple of other topics in marketing is that I want you getting used to the idea of searching for existing information. It's very easy when you start doing marketing research to think that stop, run a survey, couple of interviews, do quick primer collections, and that's it, you're doing research. But then you're missing one of the most valuable sources of information, that's the marketing intelligence. Now the thing about marketing intelligence is that it's not going to give you your answer straight up and in a straightforward manner. You're going to need to find source, evidence and information and then adapt that to solve the problem you have. So this is why we're doing things like asking you to go out, observe the world, while your tutorial and seminar exercises involve activities that require you to go off, take observations, or maybe find articles, or maybe do some research. Which we're giving you the opportunity in a safe environment to train up on the marketing intelligence behaviors. So for that, we've got the internet, newspapers, we've got existing content, trade journals. We've got looking at retailers, walking into someone's store, looking around, seeing what's going on. We've got engaging with suppliers, we've got government reports. There's a lot of material we can go and capture and observe. Now, one of the things about this, when you're doing the capturing and the observation, is that you will start needing to synthesize the materials. And then you'll start building up this library of your own projections, your own views of the world. If you get good at this, and this is something you enjoy, one of the things you can do is try heading out to doing the futurist and the scenario projections. And the futurist approach is to look at what are the trends that have currently existed, what were the indicators that said that gave these trends away? Again, you're doing this with hindsight. Then to look at, with these trends, look for current indicators. Look for indicators that you know from demographic shifts or psychographic shifts or policy shifts in government that this flagged a change in the environment you then start looking to see if you can see similar sorts of behaviors and shifts happening, and then you start trying to project to the future. Now, the thing about marketing and futurism, we have a slight advantage in that marketers can make the future. We can say, well, we project a future where single size servings become an important facet, and then we start selling single size servings to meet that market. Lo and behold, we create the market that we predicted. So we can, I won't say cheat, but we can certainly take this to our advantage. And this is a very qualitative use, a practical use of futurism and marketing research, is that you can write it up in a sellable, easily accessible manner that managers can read. So we've mentioned marketing research a few times, we've mentioned the back end. What is it specifically? It is a process, it's a procedure. It's not an end result. Now, the key thing about this is that we don't undertake the activity for the sake of the activity. 
We undertake the activity to solve a problem, to understand the world better, or to gain some insight. So as long as you think of it as a process, a process that leads into a set of outcomes. The types of research we've got available is we can either data collect from existing firms, or we can data collect to new. The custom research is what most people, what the sort of, as we say, street interpretation marketing research is. Most people think of marketing research as surveys and questionnaires. It's one facet. In fact, in many respects, it's one of the most limited and least effective facets because you can only go to custom research when you've exhausted the other mechanisms and because you won't know what to ask otherwise. So let's talk about different types of marketing research for a moment. Uh, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is that there's this the trend at the moment, it's called data mining. Uh, I say at the moment, the first time I encountered data mining was in the early 90s. This is where, as computer firepower has improved and we've got more and more complicated software, we start trying to find patterns in large bodies of data. Now, the thing about marketing is that marketing research is only useful if you have a question to answer or a problem to solve. Data mining can take place without there needing to be either a problem or a question, and that doesn't always make it useful. But one of the places where it has been very strong and very powerful is in customer retention and loyalty and customer acquisition. In effect, it's been, for customer acquisition, a type of futurism. We look at past behaviors of our customers, and we look at past behaviors of trends, and we see this on Amazon. Amazon uses data mining quite successfully, where you go to purchase a product, and it will recommend you a series of products that other people have bought. And it's done this from data mining. It has gone and said, in the event of a customer with this profile, your particular profile, selecting this product, so you go to Amazon to buy a book on marketing research, it, and you buy a book on quantitative statistical analysis and market research. It will offer you two other products, and the first product it's probably going to offer you is SPSS for dummies, and the second product will be qualitative research, because that's been the pattern of previous purchasing, so it thinks there's a pretty good chance you're going to want to do that. Data mining for customer retention and loyalty is really useful because you're going through your own records and saying, well, what was the behavioral pattern? What is the consistent pattern? And what should we expect our customers to do? And the pizza industry was one of the first groups to really take the data mining of customer loyalty to an extreme. When they started being able to predict and then pre-cook Friday night pizzas, so they're starting to track what was the most common purchase amongst their customers, how much, uh, and what patterns, you know, how much variation was there. They tracked down to the Friday nights. So in effect, they could work out that in its, if a phone call was coming from a certain area, there was a percentage chance, usually in the 60 to 70% chance, that it would be a similar pattern to the previous order, and they would be able to start pre-cooking and preparing whilst the order was being taken. Now that's one of the high-end predictive, but it was also this uh, data mining aspect helped Eagle Boy's pizzas start calculating the most commonly ordered type of pizza. So when they were creating the drive-through pizza, they knew what odds to play in terms of the percentage of pre-cooked materials that they needed to convert something from being a ham and pineapple the Hawaiian pizza to the meat lovers pizza, they had the base component parts together and they knew that they were probably one and three times going to sell the meat pizza and two out of three times to sell the ham and pineapple pizza. So they were able to pre-stock. They knew peak at times, so they knew they could start pre-cooking to be prepared and ready for these peak times. So these were one of the key things about the data mining is that if it's about solving a problem, it's brilliant. But this is where you want to be very careful is that you don't look at a pool of data and say, what's in there? It's a fishing expedition. Rather, you go and say, what is the problem I have? Could it be solved from that pool of data? All right, 
Let's talk about the steps in the process. This is a brief overview. We're going to go through each step for the rest of the chapter. I want you to be really clear about this, by the way, is one, two, three, four, and five is where the market research subjects tend to, statistics subjects tend to sort of fall out around uh, four and five. Market research subjects go occasionally down to six. Marketing strategy and marketing goes to seven, eight, and nine. The market research process is just that, it's a process. You define a problem for the express purpose of solving that problem with a report, the report then enables somebody else to make a decision. So we are steps in the process, we're not the end game. So let's talk about the component parts. Defining a research problem is very similar in many aspects to designing a strategy problem. You want it basically to be specific. So you want to know what is it you want to research. You're a marketer. Who is it you want to research? Who's the population of interest? Or what is the population of interest? Now, there's a little language thing I want you to be aware of is that this section is going to lean quite heavily on the primary data collection, but it also can be applied to secondary data. So if you think about your semester, you're going to have assignment questions. So those assignment questions become the research objectives. The population of interest becomes the question of what is the material I need to examine and what's the context in which I need to be doing this. So the problem in the environmental context is also about understanding that nothing happens in a vacuum. Research is not an isolated, neutral thing that has its own merits. It has to sit. What do we need to know? Who or what is going to provide us with that information? And why are we doing it? What's the context? So your step two is your research design. And this is an integral part to being a good marketer is being able to make the decision of what is it that I am looking for. This is also going to look at step two because step two is one of these parts of knowledge for marketing that's going to help you across the whole of your coursework and all your other subjects. Because for every assignment, start thinking about, all right, what's my research design? I need to collect a type of information to answer this assignment question. What do I need to do with this information? So start really using your research design. Use it in preparing for the seminars, use it for preparing for the assignments, use it for other courses. What do I need? How am I going to get it? And what's the best approach I'm going to take? Secondary data and primary data are your two separations here. Secondary data is what I want you to really focus on this semester. I want you going to the existing knowledge and making use of it. Primary data can also be collected, but in many aspects, the primary data that I would ask you to undertake will be observational. It would uh, fit in alongside, say, the seminar activities. You're at a point where you've got access to a major and significant body of research through Google Scholar and being on the ANU campus. A 25 US or 35 euro an article, that's a big expensive asset database. If you had to buy that yourself and you were looking at each assignment costing you two to five hundred dollars for just the readings, then things would get a little complicated. So if you start looking at your assignment in terms of, well, I brought down five or six hundred dollars worth of readings for this, you're going to very quickly pay back and get an asset base here that's uh, worth your time. So secondary data, look at what already exists. Now the research designs, first up on the secondary research, we're going to talk secondary, then we're going to talk primary. Internal sources. Now I'm really heavily encouraging you to build up your internal libraries. When you go on a research, when you go on your secondary research, you're looking through the journals and the online journals, save the PDF file. Save it and name it, organize it into folders, do whatever it takes to keep this collection of material together. Specifically because 
Once you start building up your own internal library, it becomes your first go-to point. When you get a question that you look at and go, that's similar, similar to something I've done in the past, or I know that, I know some stuff about this, you can go back to that internal library. It's also a useful asset to take with you when you travel. When you leave the university, you go out to work, you've got a, this sort of pool of resources. Also, when you're working for an organization, always look for the history. Look at what is already known, what you don't have to repeat or replicate, or what is already known that needs validation or is an assumed knowledge rather than has data behind it. So that's your internal sources, really significantly powerful device. External sources, published research, as I said, Google Scholar whilst you're on the ANU campus, absolutely brilliant. Trade organisations, there's the Australian Marketing Institute, Australian Institute of Management. They are um, our peak bodies for marketers and managers, but there are a whole series of other organisational bodies. So we've got retailer associations, we've got franchisee associations. These organisations run conferences, these conferences have publications and outputs. A lot of information, a lot of knowledge can be gained there. Also, the government does an enormous amount of report writing, and they are brilliant because the government is actually one of the most pro-business things that exists. It's got a vested interest in you and your organisations doing well because the better and more successful an economy is, start with it's easier to get re-elected, and secondly, taxation is a lot easier if there's a lot more money flowing through. So the government's actually on your side to go and make you to help you make money and get resources. So look around for government sources as well and do take them seriously, do make use of them. So that's your secondary category. In your primary research, now this is the area where a lot of the market research subject that we, we teach here will be covering. But I want you to think about this in terms of your primary research does three things. It's either an experiment to prove a point, it's either describing the world as it is, or it's trying to understand the world. So it's understanding, counting, and experimenting. Exploratory research is great. I, uh, it's a lot of the area that I work in personally and professionally. It's also one of these areas where the skill set in qualitative and quantitative understanding really works together. When you're looking at interviews, focus groups, you're getting people's opinions, you're getting verbal, qualitative work. But your job as a marketer is to interpret, translate, and then extrapolate. So this is why direct, this is why I'm teaching you not to use direct quotes. Because exploratory research requires you to take themes, take ideas, take content. A direct quote is great if it proves a point or it's valuable, but it's a picture in the novel. It's not the novel itself. So the exploratory research's strength comes from the ability to interpret pools and large bodies of data and find common themes and acknowledge the ideas that influence you, but to work with the ideas. Descriptive research is where it's about the counting. It's about percentages. It's about pie charts and bar graphs. And this is a huge amount of what you do in commercial day-to-day -day business research. Numbers to return style, votes at an election, percentage of market share, it's great. A lot of what we do in academic research is in the causality division where we are trying to experiment to understand correlations, causations and linkage. Uh, marketing itself is inherently a causal research exercise. When we change a price, change a feature, change a brand, we're conducting field tests and field experiments. So you want to understand the principles of causation, causal research, because as a marketer, you are basically experimenting. When you put the price up, when you put the price down, when you change the shipping costs, all these are variables in an experiment. So you want to be conversant with this. Even if you're not actually going to go run lab exercises, you're going to be doing a lot of field work and a lot of field experiments. All right, so the exploratory, let's talk about the component parts. I'm going to briefly go over a set of these. The things that you want to worry about here is exploratory research is prone to being non-numeric. It's quite good at what we call the, uh, the depth. 
If you come from an IT background, you've had this idea of the case scenario, the end user scenario, it's really good for getting some deep insight and really good for understanding. It occasionally comes up with some remarkably uh, interesting, yes, interesting uh, ways of seeing the world, but basically for the most part when it's done well, it is either the answer to the problem that you were trying to understand, why would the consumer want my product? What value or what's the core value they're going to get for my product? Or it can be used as the springboard to go into additional research. But again, what it should be thought of here is that exploratory research is about understanding. Now, one of the things here is that each time you have a type of technique, you have specific moves. So for exploratory research, your specific technique is a set of, it's either a consumer interview or a focus group, a case study, an ethnography or projective technique. When you select to answer a problem, you say, okay, I have a problem I want to solve. I want to solve this problem. I'm going to use exploratory research. The type of exploratory research I'm going to use is focus group. Effectively, you are basically selecting a tool from a toolkit. If you want to consider this as a rack of equipment on a shelf, consumer interview, you take that down from the shelf, you give that a go. You can't run these things at the same time. So you can't do a consumer interview, which is also a focus group. But you can make use of multiple tools. You can go, we will start with a focus group to understand what does the consumer feel that they gain from using our product. Then we'll go in, if we get a couple of really interesting responses, we'll go into some further depth one-on-one -on -one with the interviews. Then, if we still haven't got a real understanding here, we might have to go out to the ethnography to actually go and say, well, we sort of understand why. Now let's go look at how and why by observing people in their environments. So again, your tools and techniques can be multiple in use. For the most part, because this is an introductory subject, if you ask to select a tool, pick one and tell me about that one. Now, hitting up descriptive research, it is about the numbers, it is about quantifying, and it's about answering a question. It's about having a specific answer of how many. So you've got a couple of choices. You've got the cross-sectional design, which is the one-shot. You've got the longitudinal, which is the ongoing. Cross-sectional designs done repeatedly become longitudinal. Longitudinal designs done once shows that you ran out of money, but also they then become cross-sectional. Both have their merits. A cross-sectional design gets you an answer now. A longitudinal design gets you an answer later, but that answer has an additional level of consistency and tracking to see whether the, the cross-sectional design was a fluke or a recurring pattern. Causality is cause and effect time. It's the science end of the business. For a given definition of science, it's also the art end of the business. You should really understand that marketing is a science and an art, and causality and causation is in fact as much art as it is science because we're dealing with human reactions. So what we want to do with causation is that we want to create an experimental condition. We want to have something that changes worth a reason to change. So we'll look at the market, say we're currently doing well, we're selling existing products to existing consumers, and we can run an experiment of, if we decrease the price by 5%, do we sell more units to existing users? Will we make more than, will our increased turnover compensate for the 5% that we're losing on our revenue? That's an experiment. Will changing the price down by 5% increase the number of sales? There we have causation, we have a purpose, we have a reason to do it. And the other thing about marketing is that all of what we do ends up in some form of causation. Run a new advert series, does our new advert increase our sales? Change the color of the packaging, does the packaging color influence the sales? All of these things are causation. Now, having gone down to that point, having gone through here, we're now looking at primary data because primary data for 
Descriptive and for causation is quite often the main way of collecting. Surveys get a little bit of um, overkill in this chapter, so I just want to talk you through briefly each of the points. But the thing to understand is that the survey is, again, a toolkit. You come down and say, well, we're going to need some primary data. The primary data won't be, you know, focus group won't do the job. We're going to go to the survey. What type of survey? So again, this is basically picking up, uh, going, we need a screwdriver. What type of screwdriver? What size and what length? So mail surveys basically currently have a bit of um, grief to them. Effectively, the problem you run into with a mail survey is that to start with people aren't using the post. They've got very slow and low response rates and questionnaires are non-responsive. There's more depth in the book and again, look over the book, but the short summary is it's an older technology that's fading out. Phone surveys actually have uh, become problematic in terms of the way in which a phone data bank is collected. There is still a belief that landlines are the only appropriate way to be collecting uh, phone surveys. Now ask yourself, do you have a mobile and a landline or just a mobile? And if you just have a mobile, why is your data not relevant compared to someone who only has a landline? So we've got an issue, uh, phone surveys, I think, again, are starting to fall out until they shift to incorporating mobile phone usage as a, a common part. But the problem with the phone survey is that they need to be really short. I mean, their advantage to a phone survey is they're very fast. But we're talking six to ten questions. So we're also talking if you, a unknown number comes up on your phone, are you going to answer it? Or are you going to go and let it go to voice bank? So it's got its limits, it's got its pros, but again, it's a survey device, it's starting to fall by the wayside. The face-to-face, -face, this is basically the interview with the structure. Uh, let's be honest about this. This is the quantitative version of um, the customer interview. You can go for a longer questionnaire. You can, because an interviewer is conducting this, you can use if-then statements. So the questionnaire can be quite comprehensive and quite directional. So I can be interviewing you as a student and I can say, well, how do you feel about the optional Friday class? Uh, and you can go, well, I don't attend and then I can skip those questions. I'd probably ask a screening question first along the lines of, do you go to the Friday classes? Yes, no. Yes, how do you feel about the classes? No, how do you feel about the online content? So I could basically tailor, as an interviewer, I can tailor the questions. Downside to this is that when you are talking with another person, you have the possibility of social desirability bias, where people will be slightly less honest, not by intention, but by try to anticipate what they think the interviewer wants to know or wants to hear. So they try and be very proactively helpful. You know, this prone tendency to, to help means that we'll actually be giving you false information, but information we think is right for, because that's what we think you want. The other downside to a face-to-face -face interview is that they take forever. A speaker is someone who's had to conduct them. They are long, they are time, opportunity, cost intensive, and they also are prone to this moment of selection bias where you're trying to recruit people to come and ask your question. And we all know how much that, can I ask you a question, irritating opening line of a sales pitch in the mall and in shopping centers. So we've got that challenge of being able to get our hands on people to actually participate. The online is currently the way. I don't know if it's the way of the future yet, but it's certainly the way at the present. One of the things that people were really concerned about is the idea of the uh, online having, you didn't know who was responding. That's even less a reason now because we're still talking about, we talk about the anonymity of the mail survey as a bonus and the anonymity of the online as a negative. 
Also, with a lot of the patterns that we're developing now, you're not anonymous anymore. Um, questions like the no assurance of honesty. There's no assurance of honesty in mail-out surveys either. So a lot of the benefits of the mail-out survey exist in the online survey. One of the biggest benefits the online survey gives you is the instant response. As the data is being collected, the data is being loaded into the database. There is no lost survey aspect. There's no missing. You have this incredible flexibility in what you can do with your questionnaire designs. Your if-then statements are remarkably powerful. So I think that this is probably the tool at the moment. It may not be the tool of the future, but certainly has a lot of potential for online survey collection. And also the data straight up is so much easier when the data is pre-coded. Okay, the observation. Now this is primary data collection, and this is one of the tasks that you're being sent off to do in your uh, seminar preparation. And that is, you're being asked to look at the world. But now look at the world as a marketer and a market researcher. So the personal observation, you do things like you sit and you count. You have a notepad with you. You look around and note down all the brands that are available. You could even do this exercise right now. You could stop, pause the video, look around the environment you're in, and make a note of all the visible, observable brands. And that is a personal observation. Now what you would do that for is you would be using this type of thing to say to in part as your ethnographic, in part of your understanding, a part of your competitor analysis. Walk into a rival shop front and look around and just like see what marketing's in play. We also have a couple other measures for observation. We get some really neat tricks in here. Mechanical observation is the automated counting. So you'll see it turnstiles. Uh, we're collecting an enormous amount of movement data these days through mobile phones, through geolocation, through our electronic footprint we leave whenever we use things like our swipe cards. Our cameras collect, a camera on a smartphone collects GPS data so we can track where we've been. There's a lot of information we're collecting. But the unobtrusive measures is where we get to actually have a little bit of fun with what we're doing because then we can do things like collect the carpet tiles to see where in a building is the highest foot traffic. We can lay out a grassed lawn, put no paths in, wait to see where people walk through and create a track in the grass and then fill in the blanks with the concrete to create organic paths. We can do this by saying what's the most worn down aspect. We can look for physical cues. And there's one particular measure that was uh, has been done with the smart patterns and the uh, tablets is the idea that you would get someone to test drive an iPad, but to thank them for their participation, you would give them a couple of, uh, a cookie or a biscuit, something that would get the uh, oil or the fingertips going a little bit, so that their hands were a little bit greasy when they used the screen, so you'd be able to track the fingerprints across the screen. So you'd be able to, there are various tricks that they wouldn't realize that they were doing this, so you clean the screens between each round, and then you can see what uh, paths, what physical path was left on the screen. So there are tricks like this, and this is where market research is more than just calculating numbers from a survey. So we can test some fun. All right, the probably the heaviest and most consistently uh, used part of market research are the three words on the screen. Reliability, validity, and representativeness. I'm going to tell you now, this is an absolute sitter. There is always a question on this at some point in your marketing career because people want you to be able to say that when you collect a piece of information, that it will be able to be collected again consistently, that what it collects is actually what it measures is actually what you want it to measure, and that what you are measuring can then be extended to the group who you are interested in. And the representativeness is probably the key one that um, a lot of people fall on. And this is where sample selection becomes the criteria and becomes significantly important. The validity is that you actually ask that the measure 
what you're measuring measures what it intends to measure. And it's really important to pay close attention to validity and reliability because they are a key factor when we're dealing with all forms of research. All right, step four, closing down now. Well, there is only seven steps in the play, and step four is probably one of the hardest. Sampling is a critical part. There's a lot of work done on it in statistics and in market research. For you, the thing you need to worry about is what of the sampling mechanisms that are at your disposal, again, which part of the toolkit do you want to use? Do you want it to be a probability sample, which is randomized, and there's a series of sub approaches here. Simple random is anyone has an equal chance. Systematic random, systematic sampling is there's some weighting. You are random within a group for stratified. All have their merits. A stratified sample is really useful in the so far as if you want to make certain the representativeness is up, then making certain that you have representation from key parts of the population and then you can randomly select from within those key parts. Non-probability sample has its value and its uses. Don't discount non-probability sample. The personal judgment is not actually as bad as, uh, as one of the things about market research is this, this science, science, science approach. Probability gets this glowing light for its representativeness. Non-probability can give you more valid, more reliable data if that is what you are seeking. So if you're doing something like a social network analysis, you don't want random. You don't want to randomly select six people who you know on Facebook because you once were involved in playing a game on Farmville. They're not a determinant. They're not a useful determinant. If you're looking for how someone influences their peers in a social network like Facebook, then you are looking at quota and convenience samples. You're looking at non-random samples. You're looking at judging who should we look at in this network. So they have their strengths and they have their approaches. As with everything, there's no inherent good or bad in the choices. It's how you use it that counts, and that's what matters. All right, step five. This is one of the things I want to point out to you when we talk about the use of something like the research design in prepping you for an assignment. Step one is work out the design. What's the problem? The problem is the essay question. Step two, the research design. How am I going to solve this essay question problem? Step three is to go and say, well, what types of information do I need? How am I going to get this data? When am I going to go off and do the readings? Step four is, well, okay, there's a lot of stuff on, a lot of different readings. How am I going to you know, what's important, which ones am I going to take? Step five, read it. Do the readings. Step five is go out and get the data. This is the big and ugly section. This is where you get your hands dirty, your design breaks and things go wrong. We deal with it intensively in market research. We deal with it in a, a whole length subject. But what you need to understand here is what are the key factors? If you're going to say, oh, I'm not a focus group. How are you going to get that data and what's that data going to look like? And how is that data going to look different to, say, running a questionnaire? Step six, if step five is do it, step six is make use of it. Once you've got your data, you need to make a, you do the interpretation and the analysis. We've got subjects on statistics and we've got the market research subject to teach you these moves. But for you for an assignment, this is what's critical here. Step five is the collection of the data. And I see direct quotes as sitting in step five. Step six is analysis. Step six is looking at those highlighted notes you've made on your printouts. It's looking at those notes you've written up in your Excel file. It's looking at the notes you've scribbled down and then interpreting them. And choosing the appropriate technique of this is a really good piece of information. It's a really good idea. How do I adapt it? How do I then create this? How do I interpret this to make it useful? Step seven, the final part is prep it, write it, and do it. So step seven, basically for you for this semester would be write your essays. And write them early, get them out, get them drafted, get them underway, get engaged, make it fun. Because one of the biggest killers of essays 
And in German of essays is that looming deadline, that pressure. It doesn't make you focus. It makes you resentful. Don't write angry. Write happy. Write because sit down and go, you know what? I want to be doing this. I want to write this assignment. Have a smile on your face. Have your involvement level up. Be there because you want to be there and rush it up. And that is the market research chapter. Before I finish up, one of the things I want to say about market research is it is a subject area that comes with a lot of baggage and a lot of people love it or hate it. It is a really fun area. Uh, you get to do amazing things. You get to come up with incredibly creative ways of answering problems and solving problems and coming up with questions that are interesting and answers that are even more interesting. So come to it when you come to do marketing research, if you're doing the marketing major, come in wanting to do it and also going, okay, so say you feel that you're not strong on maths. That's okay. We've got qualitative. That's If you then go, well, I'm not strong on words, that's okay. We've got maths. If you're not strong on either, brilliant. We've got both. You can average it out. It's a fun thing to do. It's a fun area to work in and I really do want you to go in there with a positive view of the subject area because it is great and you get to do amazing and fun things. That's one of the areas that I worked in personally in my professional career. I worked as a market researcher and it was huge fun. You got to do a lot of really interesting things and particularly the creative adaptive approach that I'm trying to take you through with your assignments really comes into its own when you're trying to write up and explain how the world works through marketing research techniques. So as always, if you need me, you can raise me on one of these platforms or at Stephen Dan or stephen.dan at anu.edu.au. That's the market research chapter. You will have an assessment task around this, so make use of it, enjoy it, and have a bit of fun with it.